John, the 15th chapter. Some of you are back today. I've missed you. Good to have you here. Not you, Keith. I was looking over here. I pray when you learn to pick on people, you know the right people to pick on. You know, that's what's good. Some folk, some folk can't take. What's that, sir? I will. I never go outside. I always stay at the door. <laughs> oh, I look forward to hanging out with some of you this summer, too, when we have camp and ropes course and things of that nature, and hope you'll come be a part of that. I uh, uh, had one of them weeks, man. It was... I, I ask God as I'm moving through the week, I'll say, Lord, what is it you want me to share with your people on Sunday? And then I, I, I try to be as sensitive as I can to all the things that are going on around me. And uh, this week I, I went up to a, a dealership that I had uh, frequented for years. I'd, I'd bought vehicles from them, hadn't seen them in a while. My truck was acting a little weird. And so I dropped my wife off to get a, a Sister Lori to get her uh, uh, at a dentist. And I went over there. It's been two or three years since I've been there. And this man came out, the service manager. His name's Rick. And when I saw him, my heart dropped because he was so thin. He, he weighed as much as me the last time I saw him. And uh, he was so thin, his face was gaunt. And, and I, when I saw him, I said, hey, Rick. And I stuck my hand out. And uh, I'd, I've known him for quite a few years. I knew him to be a believer in Christ. I stuck my hand out. And when I did, he just pushed past my hand. And he embraced me, and he held me with tears in his eyes, and it, it, it affected me. It, uh, and I'm thinking, you know, I hadn't seen this man in years, and here we linked up just like this, you know, to hold each other. And, and we talked, and he had a, a pancre pancreatic cancer, and, and actually surviving it. And then he had other issues that the hospital caused, and he almost died from that. And in the midst of that, his 50-year-old son had a heart attack and died. And, and I, I'm hearing the heartbreak of a man. And... Um, and he's not looking for sympathy. He just went looking for a brother. Sometimes you're just looking for a brother and a sister. Amen. Went over to visit my friend Donald Cochran, who always sat over here right in front of you, Charlie. That'd be right where Patsy and him would sit. And, uh, and visiting Donald, I love Donald. And he's having breathing issues. And, uh, you know, Donald's had some physical things happen to him years ago with a fire that took place. And I love this, this man, him and Patsy. He's worked with me. And when I walked in and he starts tearing up and I said what's wrong Donald he said I pray you come see me because I asked Jesus to take me this week and I wanted to see my pastor so I walk in and of course it happened again there's that that hug that hold that moment when I'm I'm linked up with him and uh, the tears are flowing again and I'm saying man this you know this has been a crazy week already and then the other emotional thing is my my 71 Dodge Challenger wouldn't crank so I was really having issues with that car, you know. I love the old car, and, and uh, no lights, no nothing, and nothing's happening. But we got power in the front and nothing in the back. And, and my friend Neil, he's uh, working around on it. And, and then I, I remembered this, and Neil remembered it, that right outside the battery, there was a place where they put a fuse. And the fuse would actually stop the power from the battery getting all the way into the car. And so we pulled the fuse, and sure enough, this little thing here was blown, and it caused that car not to have no lights, not to crank. Nothing could happen because this one little issue that stopped the power from flowing. And I thought, how many times has one little issue stopped people from being connected, linking up, crying with one another? And the mystery to me is this, when Jesus taught us, to remain in him. Are you comfortable? You can answer honestly. No, I'm not. And I, and I don't want to get up, but I'm going to. When we break the current of contact, you lose your power. It's a fact in the life of realm, of science, uh, engineering, and nature. No touch means no power. You know, and I am a, I'm somebody that likes an embrace and a hug, and I meet people that don't. Kurt was one of them, I know. Uh, but that doesn't bother me because I've often felt like without touch, we're in trouble. We've got to have a, a, somebody to link up with and hang on to. You know, you either link or you sink. You either link or you sink. 
I remind myself of this because whether you, I know you look at me as an outgoing, extroverted person, there are times I just want to disconnect. I just want to walk away. I just want to say, you know, I'm, I'm tired. I'm just, uh, but uh, even at that moment, I understand that's what Jesus did because our linking is not just, um, what that word? Horizontal, but it's vertical. And when I disconnect from this, I need to connect to this. And if I can get along with him, I can tolerate this. Can I get an amen? I'm not pointing at y'all. I'm pointing at the online people. <laughs> All right? So it's important to me to get along with him so I can get along with you. And, and you got to do the same thing about me. you got to get along with him. Amen? So you can get along with them. So the sink is the disconnect of humankind. And we're living in an unnatural state. I, I meet people, they've lost connections. So when I, when I met Rick, I hugged Donald, when I hugged uh, the things that... This week I went to a high school. Pastor Joseph and I went to a high school early in the morning. This school's had some issues and trouble with students, like most schools. And we linked. And here I'm standing in a circle of strangers. I don't know them. I, I saw Jerome and Bethany there and Joseph and others. But I don't know everybody there. And all of a sudden, somebody reached and grabbed my hand and held my hand. And I, when I opened my eyes all the way around the circle, and I mean it was a large circle of believers right in front of that high school early in the morning, were linked together and praying over that school. And I thought, how powerful is that moment to find somebody just to link up with and to pray with? How did it occur? I, 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 I know it's devilish, the disconnect, how it all happened in the beginning in the garden. But everything our Creator made needs to remain connected to where it came from in order to fulfill its purpose. In other words, it, it's useless. Unless the tree stays connected to the soil, it's going to die. So trees got to stay in the soil. Fish got to stay in the water. You've learned that. You're smart. Amen. Birds got to stay in the sky. You remove them from their element, they die. They, they have no more connection. So when we read this scripture out of John 15, Jesus is imploring us. He's staying on us. You know, and we all know it the, the, in, the, in, certain, uh, in the King James Version, of the, remain in me and I'll remain in you. Abide. He talks about remaining and abiding. The message says it like this. Live in me. Live in me. Make your home in me just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but only by being joined to the vine. You can't bear fruit unless you're joined with me. I am the vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, that the relation, intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant, separated. You can't produce a thing. Disconnected, you can't produce a thing. Uh, if you sink, you can't produce a thing. So he goes on and says, anyone who separates from me is dead wood, gathered up, thrown into the bonfire. That's a heavy word. So what he's saying to us is, you know, you need to stay connected this way so you can handle things this way. You've got to live to remain, to stay closely connected. to self. So he's telling guys, listen, I don't know if you recognize this, but I've got to stay connected to my father. You've got to stay connected to me. We've got to stay connected to one another. And, and some people might say, you know, I don't like church. Church is a place for connection. This is where we connect. This is where we link up. This is where we have strength for one another. This is where we can look at a brother or sister and say, I need your prayer, or I need to drive, I need you to take me somewhere, or I need you to do this. You know, this is where we link. So, Father, I thank you for the house. I thank you for the family of God. I thank you for your mercies on our life. Now, God, help us to stay linked up to you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Psalm 42, 1, David understood this. He said, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. In abiding, in living in him, you seek, you long for, you thirst for, you wait for, you see, you know, you love, you hear, you respond to a person. This is all the words of living in him. When He becomes your best friend. You love him like that. In my life, and also I believe in yours, I want you to understand all of us at times go through depression. <clears throat> I would ask you, if you've not, lift your hand, but then I'd know you, I'd teach you how to lie. We all go through times when we're down. And I was talking with my pastor this morning, and I, and I told him, I said, Pastor, I'm meeting people that are really struggling emotionally with things, and I find myself doing it. And, he, and we got talking about depression, how we, it's a, he uses the word diligent all the time. 
you have to be diligent to fight against things that get into your head because this is where the battle comes from. I posted something this week about uh, rebuke a scoffer. Y'all saw that? And he'll hate you. That's toxic, people. Rebuke a wise person, Keith, and they'll love you. They appreciate it. They get wiser. Now watch this. So I posted that. A local pastor called me and said, are you talking about this person right here? <laughs> I said, bro, I ain't talking about nobody. Amen. I'm just posting scriptures all I'm doing. I'm trying to say something I taught on the midweek service. He said, oh, I was just thinking, I know this here. Was going, I thought maybe you was talking about this. But I said, no, nah, I ain't talking about nobody. Amen. I ain't using no social media as a, as a pounding place to beat people up. Hello? Amen. Now, you start that, you go down that road, it ain't never going to end. So stay away from that road. But here's the thing. Um, and, and so I told Pastor, I said, I've always believed in circular consistency. That life is circular, it's not so much linear. When I say circular, I mean there are times I'm up and there are times I'm down. But what I've learned is this is normal. I'm up, man. Yesterday I was up. Let me tell you something. You ride a scooter, Brian, with a hundred other bikers, and you're zipping in and out of traffic, and you and you actually what you're doing, you're just trying to survive. Because you're all linked together. They in front and back and squeezed in, and you're moving through, and it, 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 it was crazy, man. And, and you get through that, all of a sudden you just think, I just want to, but when it's over with, it's like And when I get here on a Sunday morning, I want to be here at the top of my circle. I want this band at the top of their circle, every teacher at the top of their circle. Because I know when you come in this house, some of you come in and you're emotionally dragging, you're mentally uh, uh, bothered, there's things that are bothered. And you come in here and you get some good worship, and you get some good word, and you walk out of this place feeling like, you know what, I think I can make another Monday. I think I can make another day. Then we've done our job by pulling you up the circle. Amen. Because that's what David did. He'd be in the palace in the cave, in the palace in the cave, in the palace in the cave. But no matter what, you've got to understand depression is a normal part of life. It's decompressing. Amen. It's breathing. It's, that, it's breathing out. It's, but when you stay there, now you're in trouble. And if you're constantly crying out from there, people get tired of hearing it. They want you to get yourself up like the rest of us have done. What makes you so special? You can waller and go, wah, 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 all the time. Shame on you. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the... Think about it. Imagine yourself thirsty, standing by a well, sweat pouring down, cramps in your legs, the first stages of dehydration, with a bucket in your hand, 30 feet below, cold, crisp, refreshing water, and the best you got is a 10-foot rope. That's how life feels sometimes. I can't reach the water. When we're cut off from electricity, you know what you do whenever the storm comes, electric, I, for those that don't have generators? Right. We stare at the coffee pot. Our flat screen TVs with satellite that carries our important sports programs. Below a DVD player, the silence of AC units. We stand there in the dark for a moment and we think about all the power, potential, benefits, pleasure, and untapped functions trapped in each of these items that were filled with possibilities whenever the current was flowing through them because now they cut off from their source and there's no more power. And every now and then I'll look at a believer in Christ and I'll say to myself, dear God, they're fixing the sink because they, they're not linked up with the body no more. They're not staying with the people of God no more. They're not linked with heaven. They're not linked with earth. When we detach ourselves from our source, things start going wrong. We think wrong. We think wrong. We start thinking what the world's been telling us and the news has been telling us. We forget that the gospel was good news. It is. We act wrong. We either malfunction or we spiritually die because our source, God, this is what God provides us with. He provides us with our identity. You want to know what your identity is? Amen. God gave you a, a son of God, daughter of God. He gives you an identity. He gives you worth. You, are so much, you have so much worth that Christ died for you, but not only that, you, you have so much potential inside of you. Amen. When, when I'm connected to my source, I feel valued. I feel like I am important to him and to others. I feel protection. Man, when you ride in a pack, listen, I've been doing this for a long time. Pastor Joseph hadn't. And that was one of the things that I was concerned about, that there are those that are riding with us that hadn't done this yet. 
Amen. So I'm asking God, give us protection today. Look after us today. And he did. Amen. I felt that. Uh, maintenance. God maintaining us. We talk about how God's a maintainer and a sustainer. Preservation. preservation. Amen. And I'm, I'm going to make it. Productivity. I, my production comes from him. Meaning and life. Every morning I get up, my meaning in life has to do with being linked with him and connected with him. People with no connection to God, they walk the earth living far below their privileges and capacity. They're victimized by ignorance. Have you ever seen anybody victimized by ignorance? What I mean by that, they're so ignorant that, that <clears throat> it's made them a victim. Listen to the crying of the victims that you are hearing in the world. they victimized by ignorance. They don't know who they are, and they don't know who their God is. But when that happens, it shifts you and changes you. So knowing the answer where we came from, it gives us meaning and purpose. Without the answer, life is nothing but an experiment. It's just something you're going through. Well, this is why mankind searches through space. We spend billions of dollars going out to space. We're trying to figure out if the Saturn rings are falling on top of each other. If Mars has got water, what does it matter? What does any of that matter? We got an ocean we ain't even searched yet. Amen. We got things that in the species we ain't even found yet. So we are searching for answers. Amen. We study primates to figure out how we came from them. If we came from them, why do we still have them? Yeah, have they not learned to shave? What happened? Why you still got primates if we came from primates? Yeah, yeah. I mean, common sense has gone out the window. Yeah. Amen. Because we not, we've lost our connections to our origin. The fall of man at the fall, we lost our sense of identity, our self-worth. Amen. What happened with Adam and Eve, it just all fell apart as well. It's our sense of personal value and significance to the world. Somebody said, well, our family is dysfunctional. Well, join the rest of the family. Everybody I met got some dysfunction. And if you ain't got an issue, you're going to marry one. So basically, we lost our sense of who we are, where we came from, what we're capable of, and where we're going, or why we even exist. Being cut off from our original purpose, amen, we function far below our abilities and potential. There's so much potential in this house. There's so much potential here. We lack knowledge and wisdom necessary for making good decisions. He said, if you lack wisdom, ask me. Come on. Ask me. You I ain't smart. I'm really not. I got through uh, high school. I don't know how. Because it's Alabama, probably. I got through college because I had a wife that could type and put things together for me as I was thinking it through. A lot of my sermons I've stolen. I stole them from preachers who stole them. From other preachers who stole them. My man Solomon in Ecclesiastes said, There ain't nothing new under the sun. Amen. So when I hear somebody say, well, you quoting me, <laughs> quit putting your name on everything else everybody else stole. Listen, we suffer. We don't know who we are because we don't know where we came from. It's why evolution is taught. It's a damnable doctrine. Amen. It's, it's, it's the dumbest thing I've really ever heard. But we don't know the meaning of life because we're cut off from our original purpose. So we seek in places that leave us empty. We can't be fully productive because we don't know where our ability and strength come from. Therefore, we live a life that is under challenge. I've often felt we are so under challenged that God wants to challenge us more to do greater things. Amen. Believe for greater. It doesn't mean I always got to do it. I just got to believe for it and watch and see what he does. We latch on to substitutes for the true source in our effort to find significance and peace. Therefore, drugs and alcohol become a part of our lives, and we start abusing it because we're, we're searching for peace. You can't find peace in a bottle. No, it's not there, man. I tried it. Can't find peace in a pill. You mean it's not there. Maybe the gospel pill, but that's the only pill. We become fearful, apathetic, or overly competitive because we're trying to survive in an increasingly unnatural environment. When one knows their purpose, it eliminates competition. I've never stood on this pulpit and thought to myself, I wonder if I ought to be here. I know my purpose. When you know your purpose, it eliminates all the competition around you. Listen, we've been separated from our source. We've been disconnected. We, uh, we've, we're starting to sink. We've lost the link. And when that happens, we have power without purpose. Come on. Stay with me here. No. No, you were good. There it is. We have money without meaning. 
You know, your money is a tool. Your money is a tool. When you learn to use your money properly, amen, you'll find that God will bless you with more money because you learn how to use it properly. Money's a tool. Amen. Position without a passion for living. Pfft. Houses, not homes. Live in a house, not a home. I, I can live in a small pl- I've lived in RVs. I've lived in horse trailers. I've lived in cabins. I can tell you, a, a home is just where you find love. Amen. It's, it's not a place that's spotless and clean all the time. That's a house. It's for sale. Right. Having children, we don't nurture. We protect animals and trees, but we kill the unborn. This is what happens when you get separated from your source. So we either link or we sink. Touch is the first sense to develop in humans, and it may be the last of faith. How many times have you wondered why your phone wasn't charged? It wasn't plugged in. How many times have I held hands with a loved one as they're passing from this life, and all they wanted was my hand in their hand? There's something about that linking up and, and connecting with people. The lack of touch uh, is known as touch deprivation. Amen. It's destructive to humans. They found out in the 1930s that if you separated a child from parents and you didn't allow that parent to touch that child, that child would begin to malnourish. Amen. But to hold a child that's, that's a, a preemie, to touch them, causes them to grow. As a matter of fact, even a, a child is healthy. If you touch them, they really start growing, don't they, Ken? So in my heart, the lack of touch, staying connected, linked during the pandemic. The lack of touch during the pandemic was worse than the virus itself. When I got to stare through a window at a man I love and yell at him while his life is ebbing from him when they won't let me in the building to touch him. Listen, I went through the pandemic just like you did. And I touched and I prayed and I held babies and I did weddings and I did funerals and I never got sick. And I ain't telling you I'm God's favorite. I'm not telling you I'm not. But I'm telling you right now that it's important for you to know that not everybody got sick when they got around somebody. And I, I, wanted, I wanted to touch some people. I wanted to go in and hold them. I wanted to help them. But to isolate them, to separate them from touch, to separate them from love was worse than the very virus that was running through their bodies. We got to have it. We got to be able to, to reach people and to pray for people. The dose of touch is as critical. Amen. As exercise and diet. The truth is, touch is necessary for survival. Research demonstrates that without it, the baby's growth is stunted, animals become more aggressive and violent, and humans experience more anxiety. It's the power of imprinting. Every time I walk in my home, this little stray dog that belongs to my wife. Jumps on the couch to touch me. She's got to touch me. She's got to lay next to me. She got, and if I let my big dog in, he goes through touch deprivation. He will lean on you till you bend down to the ground. He got to get right in your face. He got to love. That dog is all about touch. Amen. It's something about it. it. Nature screams out. You either link or sink, man. You either stay connected or you're in trouble. Now let me get to my sermon. Acts chapter 20. See, y'all know already I can't go too long in here, don't you? That's why y'all show up here. Verse 7. Upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul was preaching unto them ready to depart on the morrow. I call this message, you'd cuss too. Ready to depart on the morrow. And he continued his speech into midnight. He got to get on a boat in the morning, but he going to preach till midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber. There they were gathered together. And there sat in the window a certain man named Eutychus. There it is. Eutychus too. Being fallen in deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching. Everybody said long preaching. <laughs> See, y'all ain't never heard me preach long. But I, it's my last time with you. You may get a little length to it. He may want to say something that he knows he's leaving now. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you how I really feel. Lay that gospel out to him. Long preaching. As Paul was long preaching, Eutychus sunk down with sleep and he fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. Paul went down and fell on him, embracing him and said, Trouble not yourself, for his life is in him. Then he therefore was come up again and he had broken bread and eat and talked a long while, even till daybreak. So he departed and they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. 
That's another way of saying it was a good day. Amen. The boy's alive. He fell on him. Means to hold with affection, to press into, embracing, to take by enclosing all together, to earnestly throw your arms around someone. He, literally what he's doing is checking him. It means to check him. Amen. We understand about resuscitation. So he said, well, he must have fell on him and resuscitated. I don't know. If he did, that's fine. I don't care how he brought him back alive. The man was dead. Amen. He did. So he brought him back alive. Amen. And he said, hey, don't trouble. His life is in him. So Paul went down. The message Bible said Paul went down, stretched himself on him, hugged him hard. Ah! Amen. No more crying, he said to the people there. His life is still yet in him. He gave him something. Amen. That touch did something for him. Sometimes all you need is a word. Uh, and I'm, I'm not telling you everybody needs to uh, go hug somebody today. We don't need a hug fest. Well, what I am saying is sometimes just a word will help somebody. And sometimes it's got to be a little more than that. Matthew 8, 14, when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law laying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand. He touched her hand, and the fever left her. She got up and began to wait on him. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and Jesus drove out the spirits with a word. So some he touched. You've got to know when to touch and when to tell. It's discernment. Talked about it in the midweek. Learn, learning how to discern something. Come on up here, uh, Josiah, if you would. Don't play yet. Just look pretty. And he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities, carried our diseases. The Bible says after she was healed, she waited on him. The word wait there is the word that you understand as a waiter. To wait on someone. To serve them. She had an appreciation for ministry. She loved what this man had just done. And Peter, this was his mother-in-law. We never hear about Peter's wife, but we do know that he had a mother-in-law, which tells us he had a what? Well, very good, church. Amen. There's a place in the Bible where, in the book of Mark, where they tear a roof off the house and lower a paralytic down into it, and Jesus heals the paralytic in front of all the preachers. Later, Jesus said to Peter, and if you study it, you'll realize that was Peter's house. They tore the roof off and lowered him to. Later on in life, in Scripture, Jesus said, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no part with me. And many of his disciples left him, thinking he's talking about cannibalism. And he looks over at Peter, and he said, are you going to leave me too? And Peter said, I ain't got nowhere else to go. You done tore up my house and healed my mother-in-law. Jesus, you have messed my whole life up. <laughs> Jesus messed your life up, won't he? Some get touched. Don't tell. Hebrews 4.14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let's hold fast our profession of faith. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. In other words, he knows what we're going through. He's been touched by it, but was in all points tempted just like we were, amen, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly. Everybody say boldly, boldly. boldly. I said say boldly, boldly, boldly. That's good. You're learning. Amen. You just said it once. That's all you got to say it. I just ask you to say it. Say boldly, boldly. boldly. Just once. Well, say the word boldly, boldly. That's it. That's all I needed right there. Come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So we've got this uh, one who's been touched, one who touched. One who blessed, and he says, listen, I'm in heaven now, and if you've got a need, come boldly. Don't come in timid. Don't come in acting like you ain't got a prayer. Oh, Amen. I'm the connection between you and heaven. That connection is not broke. It's, it works through prayer. Amen. Come boldly to me and ask me what it is you want. God, I need a new job. I need a career. I need healing in my body. I need my kids to straighten up before I, <clears throat> God, I need your help today. Hallelujah. Amen. Boldly. Come boldly to the throne. 
All right, I got to finish. Back to the message. He said, we met on Sunday in worship and celebrated the Master's Supper. Paul addressed the congregation. Our plan was to leave first thing in the morning, but Paul wouldn't quit talking. He talked and talked and talked. Way past midnight, we were meeting in a well-lighted upper room. A young man named Eutychus, yeah, was sitting in an open window as Paul went on and on and on and on. The Cowboys weren't playing that night, so he went on and on and on. Eutychus fell sound asleep and toppled out the third story. That's 30 feet. He fell 30 feet. When they picked him up, he was dead. Paul went down, stretched himself on him, hugged him hard. No more crying, he said. There's life in him yet. Then Paul got up, served the master's supper. That's communion. And he went on telling stories of the faith until dawn. Wow. You ever just wish you were there? To listen to Paul tell about the stories of faith? It says that during that time they talked, Paul going one way and then the story went the other. The scripture says that they talked till morning. What do they talk? See, this is where my mind goes. What do they talked about? See, Paul had already been stoned to death. You recognize they stoned Paul. They killed him. And Paul said he went to the third heaven. So you got atmosphere, stratosphere, heaven. So he went to heaven. So, and then God put his spirit back in his body, came alive, and went back into the city uh, to the same people that killed him and kept preaching. I love his boldness. Now, this guy dies. He's dead. And Paul falls on him. Life's still in him. He comes back alive. And now they're going to talk all night long. You ever wonder what they talked about? I can't prove it. But I got a feeling that Paul said, what'd you see? <laughs> what'd you see? Oh, I saw a street of gold. Matter of fact, an angel told me he was going to come down and talk to one of your buddies, John, and give him a whole idea of what this place looks like. But I'm just telling you, Paul, I saw a street of gold. I saw a gate of pearl. One pearl. Giant, one big pearl. Again, all you Louisiana folk, all you think about is how big was that oyster? One big pearl. It's an amazing And then Paul looks at the guy, Eutychus. He said, Eutychus, are you upset with me because I brought you back? Well, I ain't real happy. Because the last thing I heard you talking about was Jesus before I fell asleep. Went right out the window. Hit the ground. HD, like falling out of a tree. Then revived. And I can see him talking. Church, we either link up with heaven and each other or we sink. There's no other way around it. We've got to stay connected. When we're connected, we're fruitful. When we're connected, we're strong. When we're connected, we encourage one another. We're all going to go through difficulties. Some going to need a word. Some folk going to need a hug. Amen? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Lord, if there was ever a time I felt your word impacted your people, it was this morning. They felt it, just like I have all week, that we need to stay linked up. Without it, Lord, we, we're in miserable times. We don't know who we are. We don't know our purpose, our potential. So I speak to everyone here. I pray, God, that revival would come into their hearts and excitement for you, that they would stay linked up with the ministries of this house linked up with other places that promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank you for healing. Thank you for healing Rick and healing Donald, healing friends that I've connected with over the week. Coming into our high schools, Lord, you link up, send your angels to link around the high schools, junior high in the middle schools, around our malls. God, stop the stupidity, the anger, the demon possession of men that are taking guns to others. 
And God, I ask you to prepare others to stop that from happening. God, let America become righteous again. Wipe her dirty face. Help this nation link back up with you in the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's it. I'm done. Our servant leaders are coming up. And again, a lot of you are giving on your phones. Go to holywild.net slash give. This is my prayer. That whatever your little issue is, that is stopping you from being connected vertically and horizontally, just replace it. Because there's nothing like the sound of a 440 rolling through a set of big pipes preparing to burn rubber. And only this little issue right here would stop it. Amen. You offer envelopes in front of you. Thank you for your giving. You know we sow it into good ground. You're sowing into good ground today. You're part of the covenant of God. As we give today, we believe in God for more money, less hours. Gifts and surprises. Finding money. Bills paid off. Settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns. Debts to modest. Royalties receive favor. Success to the kingdom. Amen. The, uh, I just want to make this one statement and then pass the David.